I've been warning about this for decades. Conspiracy theories that actually have truth at the bottom of them. The Corona Relief Bill the President signed last month contains a provision that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. It directs the Director of National Intelligence, in consultation with the Secretary of Defense and the heads of other agencies, to disclose what they know about UFOs within 180 days. So what are they going to tell us? I provided briefings for four presidents, foreign heads of state, generals, and a sitting CIA director who later betrayed me. I've seen lives destroyed. William Colby has been missing since April 27th. His canoe was found washed up on the banks of the Wicomico River. Friends murdered. Unthinkable evil unleashed on our planet. All to protect this illegal and immoral secrecy. And nothing I've seen scares me more than this unprecedented moment we are living through. We're in the final hour of an agenda that has been playing out for nearly a century. Centralized monopolies of power in government, the defense industry, and the corporate media are all converging on the same narrative that extraterrestrials are real, they're here, and they're a threat. Those are not weather balloons. Those are clearly no. autonomous aircraft of some kind that are, as you put it, swarming U.S. military craft. So These are there are two options. Under intelligent I... control. These are craft put under this, intelligent that... control, and they're flying with impunity, Tucker, within our airspace, and uh, they can outmaneuver, outperform um, anything that we seem to have. We need to find out who's operating them, and also what the intent is. The truth is, we do know who's operating them. Some are indeed extraterrestrial, and they are absolutely not a threat, as you will see. It is, in fact, the secrecy that is an existential threat to life on Earth and beyond, as stated by the first CIA director, Vice Admiral Roscoe Hillenkeeter. In 2020, I was asked to brief the president and vice president on a situation that completely spiraled out of their control. They had been lied to, just as you have been lied to. And we cannot stop what is coming if we don't finally confront the truth. This may be one of the most important photographs ever taken. A dissection of an unknown humanoid from sometime in the 1920s. It clearly isn't human. I don't call it extraterrestrial for one reason. We don't have the history of that it came out of an interstellar craft. We don't have the genetics on it. And there are a group of doctors who are obviously doing the dissection, and then there are suits very much look like government officials in the perimeter watching. A woman called me up a few months ago whose mother was a seamstress on the atomic bomb project and built the covering for the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So she was cleared to the A-bomb project. She was then, of course, moved to the only atomic bomb squadron in the world at Walker Field, which is where Roswell is. At that time, she acquired this photo. How do we know? We tested the paper to establish that it was pre-19, early 50s. And it's a photo of a photograph. And so we do a whole research project on it. We have it analyzed by the top medical archivists in the world, Dr. Burns in Manhattan, who establishes that it is the 1920s. We have the, the top clothing experts at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and determine that those absolutely are from the 20s. So medically, clothing, everything. But if it is what we think it is, it means that there had been targeting and retrieval of extraterrestrial materiel and beings that are 20, 25 years before Roswell. And 
that opens another whole chapter. Now, the reason I think that's quite possible, I've had members of my team who've been in the vault and in the classified projects who have seen top secret files going back to the late 1800s and early 1900s dealing with ETs and ET craft and beans. So everyone thinks everything happened at Roswell. No, this goes back longer. Think about that. At least 100 years of UFO secrecy. Do you really think this guy or this guy or God forbid this guy really have a grip on this issue? Excuse me, I didn't mean to fart out of my mouth. <laughs> they don't. This is why heads of state from around the world come to me, a retired medical doctor, to get the truth about this phenomenon. And sadly, they don't have the power to do much about it once they know the truth. In 2001, I brought together 20 senior military, intelligence, and aerospace whistleblowers at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for a press conference that would change the world forever. The men and women who are on this stage and the some 350 additional military intelligence witnesses to the so-called UFO matter and extraterrestrial intelligence can prove and will prove that we are not alone. This marked the public debut of the Disclosure Project and the launch of the global disclosure movement to end UFO secrecy and disclose technologies that would end poverty, climate change, and the use of fossil fuels overnight and transform every aspect of life on Earth. One of the biggest bombshells at that 2001 press conference was the testimony of Carol Rosen, an aerospace executive who worked beside Werner von Braun, the Nazi rocket scientist who came to America after World War II to work for NASA. Carol received his deathbed confession, a testimony so terrifying that we spent the last 20 years trying to warn about it. Now here was Von Braun sitting at a desk when I first met him, explaining to me that he was told he only had three to six weeks to live, but that he was gonna stay alive long enough to teach me what the real game is that's going on. And it started out when I was in the industry, the Russians were the threat. We had to build space-based weapons against the Russians. And then third world countries called nations of concern at that time. And then the asteroid threat, which I thought was kind of comical that we could just put weapons up there to shoot down or steer an asteroid. And then it leads to the last card. And then he would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. He explained to me that there was a moment when we were going to be told that the extraterrestrial beings, that their craft, were a threat, and they were not. These craft that have come here are now not UFOs, they're identified flying objects, and we know that they have beings in them. And we have witnesses here who have told you that they can shut down our missile silos, they can stop a rocket going into space that's a test. We have witnesses here who have worked in the classified departments who have the courage to come forward here to support what Werner von Braun told me back in 1974 to 77. At the end, I said, and it's all a lie. Well, it's still all a lie. The ultimate dream of the dialectical war machine, the military industrial uh, complex, is to have this war with a potential extraterrestrial civilization. It's their dream of all times. You know, you can roll into place all the kind of uh, strictures of a national security state. You can spend literally trillions of dollars a year on massive military equipment, super high tech equipment, et cetera. And so that it's logical that they would use that as an excuse. And we do know from repeated examples of it that the utilization of a false flag operation to initiate a war goes on over and over and over again. Our human family does that. The nation states do that. Hitler has done it. They dress up troops looking like some other neutral country they want to invade and have their own troops dress up like them and pretend they've assaulted somebody and they rush in and attack that country. You know, it's gone on and on. Flashback to September 11th, 2001. The world is in shock. 
The American people are paralyzed with fear and grief. Over the next few days, an unprecedented show of solidarity and patriotism. Americans fly their flag from every car and hang them outside their homes. They unify around an overwhelmed president, brought together as one by terror and loss. Few raised an eyebrow as constitutionally protected freedoms disappeared and the war drum beat loud and unopposed. The 9-11 attack set the stage for an invasion agenda that had been pre-planned for years, as General Wesley Clark revealed in a 2007 interview. He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're gonna take out seven countries in five years starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said, well, don't show it to me. When Von Braun talked to me about this faked extraterrestrial, he called it a faked alien invasion that was being planned. I saw on a board a list of countries against whom we were going to build space-based weapons. I called Wesley Clark and he answered the phone. And I said, well, you know, what is it about? And he said, well, I asked that question. What is it about? And the guy at the desk said, I don't know. I said, we're going to war with Iraq, why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> in its paper published in 2000, Rebuilding America's Defenses, the neoconservative think tank project for the new American century asserted that only a, quote, new Pearl Harbor would generate the political will for the military and defense policy transformations the group desired. Indeed, these traumatizing events are always planned or hijacked in order to manipulate perception and manufacture consent for military action and the theft of our wealth and liberty. George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, and others had decided to go, go to war with Iraq long before Colin Powell gave that presentation. I feel like uh, it was the lowest point in my professional and personal life that I had a hand in managing it. But we've come a long way since the 9-11 attacks. That same document that called for a new Pearl Harbor goes on to describe how we need to put weapons in space and even predicts the creation of the Space Force. For a complete fascist takeover, the men behind the curtain will have to play their final card, a cosmic 9-11. This temptation to generate a false flag attack on the part of some extraterrestrial civilization. You know, you, you even hear people like Ronald Reagan make reference to it. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Oh, uh, wouldn't it be clear if we all of a sudden found ourselves being attacked by a, a, an extraterrestrial civilization, we'd finally all come together. Wouldn't that be really lovely? Well, it's not really lovely for the industrial state. They don't want to lose their other enemies first. They want to use up all that before they go to that, that extreme. The last card was the most profound experience I had in my whole life. And I accepted the mission. And until Stephen Greer, picked me up and talked me into going to the Disclosure Project when I had just about given up. That's when I saw that there were other witnesses to what's going on, to the truth, to the facts. When she told me what Werner Von Braun had said, it didn't surprise me because I had previously met with a number of people in the defense industry and in the intelligence community who had already told me that there was such a plan and that, that it could be actuated at any moment, and that that was one of the long-term agendas was keep the technologies away so that we can maintain our industrial base of fossil fuel and all this. When we're ready to pull the trigger on releasing this information, spin it in the direction that benefits the foxes guarding the hen house, the people holding these secrets. But it was interesting to hear that all the way back in the early 70s that he had been warning her about this, and we know that those systems were developed in the actually in the late 40s and 50s. 
Truth seekers who explore the wonders of the ET phenomenon walk an extremely dangerous path. Most get sucked into the gravitational pull of the black hole of disinformation, where lies about the UFO cover-up and about ETs themselves poison the minds of even the smartest and most well-intentioned investigators. These lies include ETs are demons. It's all interdimensional, not extraterrestrial. We don't have man-made UFOs. Aliens are abducting people. And the worst one of all, aliens are a threat. Therefore, we need to build weapons in space. If we cannot commit to no weapons in space, to no war in space, then we're going to continue to have wars on Earth, and we're going to continue at the accelerated pace that we're in right now towards our own human extinction. One of the difficult things of the last six months was that I learned that the same group that had been feeding false information to the public through TTSA had their counterparts that had been going into the president's office providing some information, but a lot of disinformation. So the way really good counterintelligence works or disinformation works is that at the core of it, there's some truth. So they'd say, okay, the aliens are here and here's some evidence, but they're a threat to the national security and we need to have the Space Force. Wow, Space Force. And they get into this thing called the White House and the national security state, and they're completely at the mercy of the people who are going to brief them, and the ones who are assigned and cleared to talk about this issue, by definition, have been in those clandestine operations. I did a video brief for the president and vice president, and also for President Putin, that the problem is, by the time I had good access, they had already been, unfortunately, quite brainwashed on this, had already taken policy steps that included Space Force creation and what have you, and then we were running up against the election. One thing is clear is that the normal constitutional channels that you would think would be in control of that aren't. Presidents that aren't briefed in on this, heads of the, of the Defense Intelligence Agency come in who aren't briefed, in, and I'm convinced they're not from talking to them, you know, it's clear they don't know what's going on there. So there's some other structure. I happen to be persuaded by the evidence that, that immediately after Roswell, when they recovered a craft uh, and bodies uh, from, the, from the UFO vehicle, that the Truman administration set up a, a body that was outside of the normal constitutional framework of our United States government and it was made up of major elite people that they, they view as the real power elite. A shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, and the ability to pursue its own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. It's sort of a, a shadow government within the government not just in the United States, but all around the world. And, and the kind of power they have, both financially, technologically, and the means of, of projecting power militarily, is much greater than anything that the conventional military or the conventional government or the president of the United States has. Eisenhower knew it, and by the time he left office, was very upset about it. In the councils of government, we must car guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The ETs actually had reached out to Eisenhower near what's now Edwards Air Force Base, Muroc, and really wanted us to stop disrupting the fabric of the universe with these uh, nuclear weapons and advance in a positive way into space and become part of an interplanetary family, which would have been wonderful for humanity, wonderful for the cosmos. But the people who make a lot of money from war and a lot of control of the populace through fear did not want that. So they circled their limousines and sort of moved aside the good people who would have been arguing for that. And that included Eisenhower. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. The fascist element 
that is owning most of the stock in the major corporations, especially the oil corporations and the natural gas corporations and the pharmaceutical industry, the railroads, the shipping lines. Virtually all these people are fascists all during the robber baron era. That's what they did. They laid claim to those areas of our American economy and they've never relinquished them. Those families and those interests became the foundation of the post-World War II military and intelligence and industrialists. They knew that after we had detonated the atomic bomb, there were ET crafts seen all over wherever we were doing experimentation or storage or launches or anything, or even research and development. The ETs were very concerned about that for reasons we'll get into. So the military industrial complex, as Eisenhower called it, became very powerful and developed clandestine, covert, unacknowledged special access projects that eventually moved the president out of the way and pushed Eisenhower outside the inner circle. I tell people that that was the era when the presidency was decapitated. Fascism isn't, you know, somebody wearing, you know, a, a monocle and six league boots with a saber scar, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and strutting around in Nazi uniforms. A fascist is a person who believes that the best way to develop the economic resources of the planet and to distribute them among people is to get a hold of them and have exclusive privileged access to these strategic raw materials and have the corporations that have access to these strategic raw materials and to be able to put them through the machinery that they pay for and that they invest in and in establishing in producing these products and hiring people. And they believe that that's the best way to, to have their economy function. And so that the instrumentalities of the state, of the government, are put at the disposal of the private interests of the corporations. That's exactly what was going on in Germany. The Krupps and the ball bearing factories and the IG Farben corporations, all those big, huge corporations in Germany, you know, they were all privately owned. In, in fact, they were financed by Brown Brothers Harriman uh, and giving the loans to, to the post-World War I Germany to build them back up. Andrew Mellon had intimate dealings with Halmar Schacht, who was Hitler's private banker. And so did Sullivan and Cromwell. I mean, this is dirty, nasty history. Oh, invest in Nazi Germany. You know, Hitler's a great guy, he's a Republican. Don't worry about it, you'll make lots of money. And then Standard Oil, you know, through straw man in Portugal, all during the war. I mean, business thrives during war, you know that, it's a racket. That whole concept of fascism, and it's a word that gets totally misused because people somehow conflate it with just authoritarianism. But it's a very narrow definition and it's an accurate definition of what it was that the Central Intelligence Agency was doing, actually promulgating the private interest of the major corporations. And they were putting at the disposal of the interests of those corporations all the instrumentalities of the United States government, most importantly, the military and their intelligence operations and their covert operations. Uh, we're keeping the oil, we have the oil, the oil is secure. Uh, we left troops behind only for the oil. Because they basically believed that what's good for General Motors is good for America. And it was an entire theory of economic development. And so that they viewed anybody who interfered with that in any way at all as an enemy of the, of the United States. And so that, that, that's how the national security state got really established and institutionalized. And so that when they encounter a, an event like Roswell, where this extraordinary technology crashes, they realize that there's this extraterrestrial civilization that's got this technology that is way beyond anything we've got. Their instantaneous response to that was, let's get it for us, and that we'll have it, and it'll give us this, this overwhelming advantage over any of our adversaries that are threatening our world dominion, or our or what they call full spectrum dominance, was their actual term that they used. My granddad and I, when we were talking, I'll never forget it, and he said, he was talking about Patton, and of course he said, I was in Czechoslovakia with Patton in April of 45, and I thought, oh, that was neat, you know, what did you do? And then he's like, well, you know, they, Patton had to secure a lot of the stuff that the SS had, and I said, oh, that's interesting, and, and they said, well, we went into this warehouse, and there were all these exotic, you know, jet aircraft, rocket engines, parts of the V2, and maybe a V3, I don't know. I said, oh, that's interesting. He says, I saw a disc-shaped aircraft. I said, oh, 
Is that the one they built that had the BMW jet engines and the Arata ones in a circle and it didn't really work and everything like that? And he said, no. And that was it. And so the, they, they began to take this in and they started declaring it to be this huge uh, national security state secret because it was, other than the, the nuclear bomb, it was the ultimate potential weapon. And so they wanted to be able to use it at their disposal for their, for their private benefit. That fascism and the fascistic proclivities of these big industrialists and very powerful people, they know they really can't control 8 billion people unless they first control their minds and their beliefs and their attitudes. As Nazi war criminal Hermann Goering said at the Nuremberg trial, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. This is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. The buffoonery of the Third Reich was instructive and they learned that that kind of behavior wouldn't be effective. So they went subterranean, they went covert. People don't understand. We won the battle of World War II. We did not win that war. My name is Paula Harris. I'm an international investigative journalist in the area of UFOs. I've been working in this field since 1979. When I was living in Italy, I was reading in, in a journal that two little uh, boys, they called them Indian boys, had been present at a crash uh, near uh, Socorro, New Mexico. And I was wondering why none of my colleagues ever followed up on that. So when I came to the United States, Destiny had it that I was able to locate one of the men, Remy Baca. He told me in detail that they had witnessed this crash, these two little boys, in 1945. There was a, uh, an object uh, that uh, uh, shaped like an avocado. And what interested me most, because I look at the timing, is it was exactly one month after we exploded the atomic bomb. And the atomic bomb is July 16th, 1945. Five, four, three, two, one. And they actually went up to the crash site and saw three beings. They were tall and thin, they had long arms. They said they looked like a, a standing fire ants. One of the witnesses said he thought they were hurt because they were screaming. And the, and the witness was nine, it was nine years old, so he wanted to go in and help them. I had these, uh, uh, these feelings that were being projected from them to me through my mind. Uh, I, could, uh, I could feel what they were feeling, pain, anxiety. Uh, they were far away from home. They were lost. They were hurt. And I could feel that. And I could see all kinds of pictures in my mind that to this day, I have not been able to uh, uh, figure out what they were. So why it's important is we have two witnesses. It happened August 16th, 1945. And from that area, about 13 miles away, we had exploded the atomic bomb. So I thought, well, let me go there. And for five years, I investigated this case and realized that whatever happened one month later was a statement to the planet. It was a statement about our going into the nuclear age. And it was a statement that meant, wake up, because whatever you guys did one month before is going to affect you for the rest of the planetary life. Assuming that they've always been there, but what caused this great interest in us, this large incursion after 47? Well, obviously, the atom bomb. If you accept the multidimensional theory, it's highly likely that we've done a hell of a lot of damage. In somebody else's world, they might have even done more damage there than we did here. We kicked the harness nest because we actually were doing more damage in those other dimensions and worlds than we were doing here. Step in the shoes of a generic extraterrestrial who's tied into a civilization that's interstellar capable. 
And you are observing that in one person's lifespan, 100 years or so, we're going from guns and maybe cannons and a machine gun in World War I to thermonuclear weapons, then into the space age, then these clandestine and covert unacknowledged projects develop weapon systems based on studying extraterrestrial systems and then beginning to put them on satellites, on aircraft, and on ships and on land-based systems. So the ETs are sitting back and looking at this in its aggregate. And now we're decades into the solutions for poverty and the environment, decades into the ability to have a new economy that would be just, and also it would be a space economy. We could be out in space peacefully. We're decades to when we should have ended the war to end all wars was supposed to be World War I. What are we done? One war after another. Now they want to launch the big one, the, this final card that Werner Von Braun spoke of, interplanetary war by hoaxing an alien threat. So these civilizations are really quite appalled, frankly. And at the same time, we're using weapons like atomic and nuclear that disrupt the fabric of the universe and their worlds are affected. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. I am death the destroyer of worlds, plural. Worlds, plurals, not just this planet. So it, it, it got to me that Oppenheimer knew right well that they were having UFO visitations, that someone was interested, and I had in my possession already the MJ-12 documents that are on Ryan Wood's website. A letter from Robert Oppenheimer and Einstein addressed to President Truman it's called relationships with celestial within our bodies. When you say relationships with celestial bodies and you are ca calling whoever was over that area cultures, you're not really talking about any kind of hostility. What you're talking about is more integration. So that whole document said, what do we do with this problem? Do we communicate with them and treat them like they're another country? And if so, the United Nations is not capable of handling this. In the document, it says we need to create a supra United Nations. These are the words of Einstein and Oppenheimer. Who can deal with this problem? The ETs have done a number of things when we go too far where they stop it. Now, they don't do anything hostile or violent back. They've made it quite clear through very explicit events where the ETs do not want humans going out there with guns blazing. A couple of nuclear weapons sent into space were destroyed by the extraterrestrials. The one incident, for example, was they, they actually photographed the uh, UFO following the missile as it climbed into space and shining a beam on it, which uh, neutralized the, uh, the missile. And that is their major concern, is to preserve the integrity of the Earth because it affects their own system. The very end of the 70s and the early 80s, we attempted to put a nuclear weapon on the moon and explode it for scientific measurements and other things, which was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials. And what happened? They destroyed the weapon before it got to the moon. The idea of any explosion in space by any Earth government was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials, and that has been demonstrated over and over. And what's the consequence? How is that demonstrated? By the destruction of any nuclear weapon sent into space. If they were hostile, they would have, bought, they would have just eliminated all that testing. They don't. That's, I find out that is not the way they operate. They warn. They say, what the heck are you doing to your beautiful planet? And you, you have a choice. We have a choice. We can listen or we can let it happen. 
If people are watching the media right now, they're not hearing about the peaceful extraterrestrial craft. What they're seeing are released, supposedly leaked documents, leaked videos, much of which is not even true. They're not real. It's faked right there. And it's being presented in a format that is to cause fear, to make us see the crafts and the beings as enemies. There's no question whatsoever that the elite that are in charge of the national security state infrastructure, uh, both the official infrastructure and the unofficial infrastructure, are in fact not only fascistic in their economic vision, but they're racist. So I'm telling you, when you see the, do the documentation that goes on inside the Third Reich and in the courses that they were teaching at those, at the thing called uh, the Ordensbergen, the Ordensbergen was this series of four castles where they trained the SS people and you get access to their documents where they're talking about this eugenics and, and everything. Why is it that they hate the Jewish people the way they do? And people don't have any idea. People, don't, people got some weird distant ideas about this, mainly because we allied so closely with the fascists, even immediately after World War II, that they suppressed all of this information about them. And so people don't really know the details of, of what their thinking was. But the, the, the bottom line is, is that this issue of racism uh, runs extremely profoundly deep in this elite white male Caucasian elite that owns most of the stock and, and shares of the major corporations and are the promulgators of this fascist ideology, right? And these are the people that were put in charge of the UFO program right from the beginning. Many people who would consider themselves new age and into all this stuff fall into these camps of, well, there are the good aliens and the bad aliens. And the good aliens almost always look like someone from Norway. And the bad ones have different features or maybe darker. I'm going, this is racism. You just call it out what it is. This is absolutely racism extrapolated into an interspecies level. Not just racism, but speciesism. <laughs> you know, which is even de deeper. Uh, we have to try to overcome this. We have to train ourselves. They're hoping that we as humans evolve out of this mindset of ingrained racist tribalism uh, and not go down the path that these covert interests want us to do and extrapolate into space, push out into space the racist world we've had. I call it exo-racism. Justification for war or genocide always begins with dehumanization of the enemy. For example, as part of their anti-Semitic propaganda campaign, the Nazis revived the centuries-old blood libel, the allegation that Jews murder non-Jews, especially Christian children, in order to obtain blood for the Passover or other rituals, in order to lay the foundation for a false flag alien threat. The national security state has engaged in a similar propaganda campaign for decades, a cosmic blood libel. The national security state apparatus and their media allies have been flogging that particular theory that these, these extraterrestrial civilizations are all here to eat us or to take over our planet and rape our women. You know, I mean, there's, there's a whole scenario that's always gone on on the part of uh, authoritarian warrior states you know, about the ultimate other, the Hun. 95% of all of the movies that have ever been made about extraterrestrial life have portrayed them as hostile and dangerous to us, you know, and, the, and, and it sells in, in that way. I don't know why people watch those movies. On the other hand, I don't know why people watch cage fighting either. When Unacknowledged went viral and got hundreds of millions of people to see it, within months, they stood up the TTSA with Luis Elizondo, who is a famous disinformation operative in the Pentagon, at least amongst intelligence officials that I've met with, and others who are well-known disinformation figures within the UFO subject, that began the whole process of trying to pull the narrative back to, gee, we don't know what these are, but here's the evidence that we're, quote, leaking, which wasn't a leak, it was a controlled release. And then they hit the button. So the mainstream media that will take dictation from the intelligence community begins to cover it in the New York Times and CNN and every network around the world. Whereas the Disclosure Project has 
a hundred times more direct military witnesses and better evidence. And they wouldn't touch it because it doesn't have the threat narrative attached. It doesn't have the agenda attached. Picked a melon. This is a tradition in our family. You know, as you said, the melons were the first family of intelligence that will go along with, you know, we need to do this for the good of the country. You know, yes, you gotta lie and do whatever you have to do, but you know, this is what we need to do. And they'll just do it. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, stay silent when pe members of my family lie to the American people. I won't do that. It's one thing for my dad, you know, in the old days, to get up there and do some mild fibs about, you know, highways. This is not, you're, you're messing around with the survival capability of the human race. I mean, I'm not, that's not an overstatement. This is deadly serious, it's not funny. I know from direct conversations with Lou and with Chris that they know that the major military authorities with whom they've had very close communications realize that if in fact the extraterrestrials were hostile in their intent toward us. They could have done anything they want to do. They can come and go at their pleasure. And so that, that in that regard, they do not constitute a clear and present danger to our national security. But they also know that they're in the habit of getting their, their funding for all of their entire organizations, et cetera, by flogging a threat. And so that they're inclined to do that because the simple fact is they don't trust the people in Congress. They think the people in Congress are, are so Pavlovian uh, in that they, in fact, distrust their constituency so much that they have to scare them. And so they say, well, if we're gonna be able to justify having hearings about the UFO issue, we're gonna have to tell our people that, you know, oh, they're a potential threat to us. And so that, therefore, they're conning their own constituents. And then they are getting conned by the military industrial complex because they don't trust them either. And this is a question of integrity. That as long as people are not trusting each other and they're conning each other, you know, this is dangerous. This is how wars start. Uh, this is how people lose control of the, of the narrative of, of what's going on here. Those of us in the CE5 community, et cetera, need to establish some kind of level of discourse uh, with Lou Elizondo and with Chris Mellon. All they have to do is know that we're obviously sophisticated enough to know that what they're saying publicly, they know isn't true. We have to be able to establish diplomatic relations with our own people uh, if we're gonna establish diplomatic relations with an entire extraterrestrial civilization. And so that we can't just degenerate into the same kind of low consciousness bullshit, you know, that we're afraid of. The facts about UFOs are so much stranger than the lies that you discredit yourself simply by telling the truth, especially when it comes to so-called alien abductions. Perhaps the most devastating aspect of the cosmic blood libel is the hoaxing of alien abductions by humans in order to create a culture of fear towards extraterrestrials. Dozens of insiders have confessed this secret to me, but it wasn't until 2016 that I was able to get one of them to say so on camera. We did do that, yes. Uh, OSI did that. There was a special group uh, out of uh, the 7602nd Air Intel Wing at Fort Belvoir that came out and did that. They uh, had these uh, people that had maybe some sort of defects, uh, antonomical defects that were uh, brought, brought in to, 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 to fool people and thinking they're aliens. Yeah, um, I can't give you any specifics because it's still, the program is still classified and they're, they're probably still doing it. I wouldn't doubt, doubt it, they were still doing it. Uh, these civilians got onto the base uh, and, and got into something and they, they, uh, they saw something they weren't supposed to see, and this group came out and went into their home and scared the dickens out of them. And Staged an alien yeah, event. Exactly. We have these technologies. They are being used in false flag operations where they hoax events. And the purpose for all of that 
is a sort of psychological warfare, as it says in the CIA document I have, the director of the CIA saying, the UFO subject is very valuable for its psychological warfare potential. And that is a very interesting thing to be written in 1953, right? And what does that really mean? Well, it means that the long-term defense strategy from the late 40s and 50s forward was informed by eventually using this last card to consolidate sort of a global uh, totalitarian military control of the, of the population. Could it be manipulated purposely by people who have the technology to uh, simulate UFO sightings? And people say, well, of course not. Who would do a thing like that? Well, I would remind you that during Watergate, during the Watergate investigation, it was discovered that there was a plan uh, originated in the White House to uh, surface a submarine off the coast of Cuba and paint the second coming of Christ over the island of Cuba using holograms, oh, and, yeah. which is well within our technology today. The idea was that since there is a large Catholic population in Cuba, uh -huh. they would be so upset by this vision that this would saturate the communication channels, you know, the telephone system in Cuba long enough for an invasion to take place. How interesting, I never heard of that. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, a classic in psychological warfare, but mm -hmm. that kind of uh, manipulation is, is well understood. And I have personally investigated several apparently you know, genuine UFO cases where there was, in fact, manipulation. My, my conclusion, the conclusion of scientists working with me, was that there was, in fact, a manipulation taking place and that it was not a hoax on the part of the witnesses, but a hoax on the part of somebody much better organized than in Ballet's book, Forbidden Science 4, he describes a smoking gun document that confirms what Doty said in an entry dated Thursday, 26th of March, 1992. Ballet writes, I have secured a document confirming that the CIA simulated UFO abductions in Latin America as psychological warfare experiments. We reached out to Dr. Ballet and asked him if we could publish the document in this film. He refused and tried to blame the producers of this film for his decision to not release it. Unfortunately, others in the UFO research community have similar evidence of this cosmic false flag, but are afraid to come forward publicly. This lack of courage or integrity or both is precisely why the secrecy persists. I also asked Richard Doty about the last card scenario, using the military lingo for false flag, deceptive INW, which stands for deceptive indications and warnings. Ha have you been exposed or did you come across in, in your career and your network um, the, the false INW or, or the deceptive indication and warnings projects related to this? Yes. And what did you find out about those? Um, that's pretty cla That's pretty hush. That's I, I don't think I should talk about that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's where I, when I briefed the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, that was the main subject. That is, um, yeah, that's very uh, sensitive. Yeah, it's very, very sensitive. Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. yeah. So we'll just pass that question on. <laughs>
I always thought it was about, you know, everybody would panic and the religions would fall. And I, ha I had no idea this was going on. And ever since my association with Colonel Philip Corso, I realized what this is about. What this is about is the toys, the artifacts. And it's really about the industry. It is not about whether people would be scared or whatever. I think that the younger population and people that have studied this know that there is no danger. I mean, if they're not going to bomb you during the time you're doing the H-bomb tests in the Pacific, I don't think they're going to decide to come out of nowhere and bomb everybody or to, to have an invasion. There are too many times where we could have had an intervention that was hostile and we never have, and we're the enemy. Hey, John, happy birthday. Uh, there's no way that I can like sugarcoat this. The, I was talking to a gentleman about the UAP report and he contends the Pentagon has alien bodies and crafts. So I just wanted to run this past you. Is this, does DOD have these things? And if so, where? Uh, Jeff, the. Um... The UAP uh, task force is really designed to uh, to take a look at these uh, unexplained aerial phenomena, try to help us uh, uh, get a better understanding of them. Again, I'm not going to get ahead of the uh, of the report that uh, the DNI will submit that we are helping, obviously, and providing I input to. Um, and uh, I think I'll just I'll just leave it at that, Jeff. This exchange would have been unthinkable even a few months ago and notice that he didn't deny it. There are three major lies of the current false flag disclosure of UFOs in the media. Number one, we do not know what UFOs are. Lie. Number two, the US military does not have any aircraft that can perform in the way these UFOs maneuver. Lie. Number three, they are a threat to national security. Lie. The only threat to national security and world peace is the unacknowledged projects using man-made UFOs and other technologies to hoax alien events, period. And yet, we are inundated with messages about the threat to national security posed by UFOs. We take all incursions uh, into our operating spaces seriously. Um, uh, so, I mean, uh, like everybody else here at the, at, at the Defense Department, uh, uh, certainly we are taking the entire matter seriously as it, uh, uh, for that, regarding the potential for, um, uh, for safety, for safety uh, concerns. One of the most brilliantly subtle disinformation techniques currently being deployed against the people of Earth is this air of phony agnosticism that has been generated surrounding this issue. Do you believe that they sincerely don't know what these things oh, are? Oh, they, they and don't. They we from? have the best. We have the best military on planet Earth. The greatest intelligence agencies. These are true unknowns, and they were swarming our, um, you know, military arsenals. This. They're seen over nuclear facilities. This is documented. We need to find out who is operating yeah. these vehicles. There's a certain studied agnosticism that the media is allowing to come out through these um, uh, ufologists. For example, Nick Pope. I mean, we are under siege. It's like there's a war of nerves going on. And uh, if, if this was drones belonging to a foreign adversary, there would be an absolute outcry. And yet, the situation we're in, that we don't know what these things are, and they might even be extraterrestrial, that's worse. So I agree with Luis Elizondo on this. This is a potential catastrophic failure of intelligence. The same thing with people like Chris Mellon, whether he's been paid or not, he will go up, get up there and say, well, we don't know what these are, we need to study them. There's a vital national security issue, which is that our sovereignty is being violated by vehicles of unknown origin. Chris and I have met, we've talked about all this stuff. I think 
The TTSA program was a little goofy with Tom DeLonge. This is a mechanism to change the way the government acts. Uh, you're going to see us dealing with the Senate, us meeting with the intelligence services of other governments, and everyone is coming out of the woodwork and saying, this is real, we got to do something about it, and it very well could be a threat, but we can't put our head in the sand. Former Blink-182 frontman Tom DeLonge launched To The Stars Academy, or TTSA, supposedly to bring scientists and whistleblowers together to advance the disclosure of UFOs. In reality, this was a thinly veiled front group for the Defense Intelligence Agency, staffed with notorious spooks like Jim Simivan, the former head of covert operations domestic for the CIA. All of a sudden, the same media outlets that historically ridiculed the subject started fawning over DeLong and his entourage of disinformation agents and always with the specter of an alien threat. Hal Putoff was wanting, you know, soliciting me for funds for his quantum communication thing, which I think the Navy has had for 30 years. So right. there's a lot of disconnects going on. And of course, they've left that TTS Bay program, and I don't blame them. Uh, I think it was a shit show and uh, some type of CIA, you know, quasi psyop something. And I don't think anybody was really excited about it. And when they say, this is a mystery we need to solve, that is not true. As you and I know, the US military, especially the Navy, has reams of information on every shape of craft, where it's from, who's driving it, what they're up to, you know, Forget it. It's just been going on for 70 years. Uh, the military industrial complex is not stupid. Neither is all the branches of the military. They know exactly what's going on. I think Chris it, it means well. I, I really do. I don't think he's one of these guys, you know, that's going around here, I'm going to fool the public and get paid for it. He doesn't need the money. I don't need money. We don't need fame or money. That's the last thing a melon wants. I'm telling you. And of course, TTSA even had a Lockheed Martin Skunk Works engineer who said, we need more money to study this because we don't know how these operate. In 1984, I got my chance to go to the Skunk Works, I'm working on things that defy imagination. Meanwhile, we published a letter that was written to Ben Rich, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works. And, and the person writing was a friend of, of Ben Rich and said, are these UFOs ours or extraterrestrial? And Ben Rich writes back, they're both. He acknowledges that they are both extraterrestrial and ours. Now, this is not some UFOlogist. This is the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, the premier aerospace engineering entity, arguably, in the world. Another man exchanging letters with Ben Rich was military aerospace historian James Goodall, who was Rich's pen pal and confidant for 25 years. I met Mr. Goodall in April of 2021 at the 20th anniversary of the Disclosure Project, which we celebrated in Scottsdale, Arizona. He was dying of esophageal cancer. This is the mid-90s. He'd already retired from Lockheed. And I tracked him down. He was at USC Medical Center uh, near, near the end of his, his life. And we were talking about John Andrews and some other stuff, and we started talking about UFOs. And he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert that's 50 years beyond what you, and he was you know, talking directly to me, beyond what you can imagine. And if you've seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. I said, Ben, you want to expand upon that? And typical Ben response was no. The first time I realized that some of these vehicles were actually man-made was when I met aerospace illustrator Mark McCandlish, who testified at the Disclosure Project press conference about a highly classified air show at Norton Air Force Base, where reverse-engineered flying saucers were unveiled for those with a, quote, need to know. A male staff member in Congressman Brown's office not only confirmed the exhibit, but the fact that there were three discs at that exhibit. These discs were hovering off the floor without any visible means of support. They were referred to as alien reproduction vehicles, also nicknamed the flux liner because they used high voltage electricity. Uh, this, this is a diagram that I uh, made based on a uh, 
a sketch that Brad Sorensen did for me in rough form uh, sort, uh, shortly after he uh, had his uh, sighting and uh, subsequently cleaned that drawing up and made it much more accurate. And that's the, uh, the drawing that Dr. Greer is holding there now. Later on, I obtained uh, photographs that were uh, taken in 1967 by a military pilot, Harvey Williams, flying a C-47 for the Air Force at 12,000 feet, approximately 25 miles southwest of Provo, Utah. Uh, this particular vehicle matches the so-called ARV uh, in all proportions and respects in terms of the detail of the shape of the craft. News articles from the 1950s describe how we were on the cusp of unlocking the secrets of gravity, which would unleash a technological revolution. But suddenly the article stopped without explanation. This is the point where we cracked anti-gravity technologies and it went totally covert. And this Tic Tac, the word is, it's Lockheed Martin. It's the successor to the TR-3G black triangle model. Elizondo just will talk the bark off a tree, he goes in circles, he's a great counterintelligence guy. Uh, I'd love to get into a debate with him, but of course that's never going to happen. Well, this is a document that was obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, and it demonstrates quite clearly that we have had issues with these, if you will, these UAPs or UFOs in the vernacular for, for at least 70 years, at least since 1950, probably earlier. And this is official U.S. government correspondence. This isn't some eyewitness report from, from a civilian. This is official government documentation from military personnel to very senior military brass. And what it says is very, very quite compelling that, look, we've had a lot of military and intelligence eyewitnesses to include special agents. Uh, and scientists and all of them are seeing these things and more importantly the frequency uh, has occurred on a regular and continu continuing basis over sensitive uh, US military facilities and this has been occurring Tucker again since 1950 the US government has finally admitted that this is not some sort of secret US technology quite the contrary over the years, dozens of defense and aerospace industry insiders have briefed me on what they were really working on at places like the Lockheed Skunk Works, going back to the 1940s and 50s. Many of these man-made aircraft have been spotted by thousands of eyewitnesses and become part of the UFO lore, indistinguishable from actual ET craft. These rogue, covert operations within the military-industrial complex stage thousands of sightings, abductions, mutilations, and disturbing encounters with our public-facing military, knowing these incidents will be mistaken for ET craft. This confusion between what is extraterrestrial and what is man-made is essential for pulling off a false flag that would be blamed on aliens. Uh, this is uh, from 1983, Hudson Valley, very famous cases, many, many witnesses to these uh, transformer sounding objects and underneath when they were closed, you can see superstructure and tubes and other things. That is not extraterrestrial. Now, have there been extraterrestrial vehicles of boomerang and other shapes? Yes. But where do you think they get the idea? And also, how else do you create a false flag? You have to create structures that would be believably not aerodynamic. Some of them are kind of hybrids. They'll have some conventional propulsion as well as electrogravitic, and they all have structural superstructure components that are clearly a man-made machine, not an interstellar vehicle. And this is 1989 in Belgium that you can see all the tubes and structures underneath. Again, this is global. These are also well-known platforms. You can basically, once you get your lifter system in place that causes mass cancellation, you can create any kind of air structure around it. And it doesn't matter if it's aerodynamic or not, because the way it moves, it moves, let's say, the molecules of air around it. So it's basically moving an electromagnetic field effect so there's no resistance and there is no sonic boom. That's man-made, we've had it for decades. This one is great because it has, if you look at the underside, there are the girders and the structures and the people under it could see that and could see the light in the center and the three on the end. That is uh, man-made. 
there are, are extraterrestrial vehicles that are triangular and that are saucer shaped and there are other weird shapes. So to make things complicated here, you, how are you gonna know? Well, you gotta be close enough to it to see. And if you can't see it, the, the superstructure detail, you're not gonna know whether it's extraterrestrial or not. This is from Southern Illinois in 2000. They went from animal mutilations being staged by clandestine human organizations to these were doing human vivisections and killing humans. But of course they wanted everyone to believe the aliens were doing vivisections on people. No, it wasn't. Which ones are man-made and which ones are extraterrestrial beings? Dr. Greer is figuring this out. We've got to listen to this information. These are facts. This is not rhetoric. And then we've got to be able to apply it. We're taught to be afraid. We're taught to fear. We're taught to fear extraterrestrial beings. Really, uh, get over it. Meanwhile, you have people who would purport to be experts in UFOs going on Fox News and other news outlets saying, we don't really know what these are. It's a big mystery. They've lied by omission. And when they say it's a mystery, that's, that's a lie. OK, I'm sorry. But that, you know, I'm not on board with that. And that, you know. They, but, but they have to know that's a lie. Right. So they, they do. And I, I think, you know, it's obvious. So, you know, that's why I'm giving this interview with you today. I mean, I've had enough uh, of that. I had enough with my dad. You know, was he a liaison to Majestic 12 as a magic member? Probably. You know, he probably had two pages of the UFO file. You know, don't worry about the rest of it. Just the two pages are all you need. Okay, yes, sir. You know, and Chris is going, yes, sir, too. So those people are very studied agnostics who act like we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. And that's why they're given an audience. If they were actually to say, here's what they are, here's what they're doing, da, 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 which is what a truthful disclosure would be, they would be banned off those networks. I don't think I've ever spoken to anyone who has seen more reports, paperwork, photographs, interviews as you on this topic. Has there ever been a confirmed extraterrestrial ship? We'd have to say no. We'd have to say what's confirmed is that we don't know what this, this let's call it a ship or an object. We don't know what it is. We can just say what it isn't. And you know, you can ask yourself, well then what, and of course the ex, what we call the extraterrestrial hypothesis is, an, is a valid one. I mean, maybe it is from some other place in the universe. In the axis of disinformation, Leslie Keene is the original shameless opportunist of ufology. Over two decades ago, Leslie embedded herself in the planning and execution of the Disclosure Project and then betrayed our trust by hijacking our top secret witnesses and case studies and repackaging them. Most people don't realize that on the day of the Disclosure Project press conference, intelligence agencies jammed our signal leaving the National Press Club building for the first hour. Leslie was there and she knew that we had revealed too much. She adopted this fake agnosticism so that every door to mainstream media outlets would be open for her. Anything that can operate in impunity within our airspace, within in strict, restricted airspace, that can have near misses with our Navy pilots, is, is, has to be considered a potential threat. Anything that's in the skies that we don't know what, you know, we don't know what it is, and it's demonstrating incredible capabilities. The only way the Department of Defense is gonna deal with it is to see it as a potential threat. Anything that enters an airspace that's not supposed to be there is a threat. After receiving classified briefings on UAPs, Senator Marco Rubio called for a detailed analysis. This past December, while he was still head of the Intelligence Committee, he asked the Director of National Intelligence and the Pentagon to present Congress an unclassified report by next month. We've gone this way before. Uh, there have been many initiatives. Gerald Ford, when he was a congressman, held hearings, went nowhere. The whole window dressing of Project Blue Book, and then that was just really a publicity stunt by the Air Force. And most recently, the $22 million that the Pentagon spent on this Bigelow Aerospace Study. 
I had a Zoom meeting this summer with General Herbert, the, the chief advisor to Senator Harry Reid, and they authorized this funding. After spending $110 million, maybe more than that, because it was a six-year-long program, where's the beef? What's the results? It's, yeah, that money went to Robert Bigelow, who was in Nevada. And he's a buddy of Harry Reid's, right? Right, who was Huge chair of that committee. UFO proponent. Exactly. Thinks they've definitely come here many times. Right. So, you know, you've spent $100-plus million gathering information, and what, do you, what did you do with it outside of, you know, collecting a couple of videos? The people in that circle around uh, Mr. Bigelow and Bigelow Aerospace were all operatives of these unacknowledged special access projects. They made sure that those $22 million were the equivalent of opening a toilet lid, putting the money in and flushing it. And so what General Herbert said to me is that even in the meetings in the Senate classified SCIF, Secure Communication Information Facility in the Senate, all they got was like a 40,000 foot view he was an army pilot, and, and no detail, no nothing. And I said, yes, that is what was done and was done on purpose. And so there was a pretty sizable budget for this program. What did they find? Well, I mean, basically what they did with that budget is a lot of different research to try to document what was going on, to try to understand the physics behind the, how the objects, you know, move around, and, and then to just keep records of what they were observing. But they haven't been able to find what they are, where they're from, or anything like that. And I said, do you feel they were holding back? He says, oh, yeah, a lot. And we were very angry about it. Ultimately, the reason that $22 million grant wasn't renewed is that he and others realized they were being zoomed. They were being deceived and getting nothing out of it. It remains to be seen if they get anything out of this mandatory director of national intelligence and also naval intelligence report that's going to go to the Congress. I think that the more information that's in it, it could be even more dangerous than nothing because I think they will cherry pick cases that they will spin as evidence of a national security threat. And that's what's been ramping up in the media. So my concern is we need to get ahead of that curve and release to the public this information with the evidence and everything we're presenting so that people at least ask the critical question. Is that report full and accurate? And is it even the truth? I think we need a lot of skepticism. If it's coming out of the US government or any other government and the mainstream media, until proven otherwise, it is cherry-picked information and someone has an agenda because they've hit the button, the go button with the mainstream media to cover it in a very specific way that does not redound to the benefit of the human race. Von Brown gave me the idea that we should have a bill in the Congress and it should have a matching treaty. Well, we did for a while, but in the Congress it didn't work, not in this country. So I went international. And international is where I found some intelligent life that was really willing to create an agreement, a treaty, to prevent the placement of weapons in outer space. Да, наверняка инопланетяне в той или иной форме и в том или ином образе присутствуют на планете Земля, потому что из миллиардов галактик по теории даже вероятности не может организованная разумная жизнь существовать только на планете Земля. Но пока инопланетяне своим присутствием не нанесли никакого ущерба землянам, инфраструктуре, и вообще живым организмом на Земле. Поэтому говорить о том, что есть инопланетная угроза, ну, это, наверное, не соответствует реальности. The beauty of having these Russian generals come forward and say this is that we've had a lot of, like, Colonel Corso and others come forward with evidence. Now we have these senior people uh, in Russia, and we need more countries to do this where they unshackle their leaders who know the truth of this and speak the truth to the world community. Now, if you listen to a lot of people, you hear, ah, oh, there are already weapons in space, blah, blah, blah. But the fact is, if anyone reads this treaty, which is hard to get them to do, it's on peaceinspace.com, then you will start to see, and it does tap people, along with the treaty, CE5 events, where people can actually have an experience, 
What more do we need? Well, if you're listening to the scientific method that's been taught to most of us, there's no evidence, we're still looking for it. That is ridiculous. What about the people like me, like Dr. Greer, like 900 other witnesses? What about them telling the truth, risking their lives, the courage that it takes to do this? I haven't had it until now. There is another path just outside the gravitational pull of that black hole of disinformation. It's the path I've spent my whole life fighting for and protecting. It's the path that leads to enlightenment, world peace, and the realization of technology so advanced that to us, they would seem magical. This is the path of truthful disclosure and peaceful relations with our brothers and sisters from the stars. CE5, or Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, is a set of protocols I developed to initiate peaceful contact with interstellar civilizations. It's easy enough for anyone to do and will absolutely transform your life. Millions of people are learning how to do CE5 by connecting with local CE5 groups or by downloading guided meditations in the CE5 contact app. Doing that in the context of meriting citizenship in, in a galactic civilization is a very meaningful meme to say, look, we, we need to work on ourselves. We need to elevate our consciousness. We need to hearken to the higher angels of our own nature, et cetera. That, that's all a, a dynamic that we do have control over. That's why I think the CE5 thing is so important because you know that, that's the best way to get data, not to be speculating you know, from our own political ideology about what they might be like. You know, we really have to have direct communication with these beings, the, the more the better. That dual role of elevating our own consciousness and rising to the highest levels of the angels of our own human nature on the one hand and reaching out to establish communion and contact with the extraterrestrial beings themselves are the two pathways, the two pathways that we have. And in dealing with the national security state, we just have to take whatever steps we can in the legislative realm to impose treaties to keep us from doing things like militarizing space and developing space weapons and, and all that kind of stuff. That's another third leg of this stool that we have to really do to, to exercise whatever kind of control we can have over the political realm. And that I think is the only way we're going to have not just world peace. And you know, world peace should have happened at the end of World War I. We have to have universal peace. At this point, world peace is too late. We're already in an interstellar moment. We're already in a cosmic time. So we have to have universal peace. And universal peace comes from both our external policies and behaviors and from within, the great peace within, the state of universal consciousness. As we wrap up this film, we are seeing the threat narrative intensify by the day. Language like, we need to stop trying to contact aliens, seems to confirm my long-held suspicion that CE5 would be blamed for a staged alien attack. Do not believe this lie. This isn't entertainment. This is our survival. I saw that Dr. Greer would never stop doing this until he took his last breath and that he needed help with this. This is not about us. It's not about, uh, you know, fame, fortune, money. There is no money anyway uh, in all this. It's about finding a group of people that have the same vision, but the most beautiful vision he has. And I've attended so many CE5s is that he has found a way a non-hostile way to communicate with who's ever out there because whoever's out there is depending on him to change this situation. So that for me is the most important. The CE5 protocols that everybody can do is gonna make a darn difference. So for me, the Disclosure Project is, is a miracle and it hasn't been easy. It has not been easy. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> I love you. <laughs> you just keep going. 
we're here. <laughs> you just keep going, okay? I'll never leave you, so you just keep going. Do what you do, and do what you do the best, because if we don't do it, nobody's going to do it. Do you understand that? Okay. Yeah, okay, can I go outside and get some sun? <laughs> yes.